both of those. Good afternoon. Good morning. Okay, we're off to a bad start. <laughs> I've been up for a little bit too long. Good morning. Welcome to our worship. Uh, it's a nice, bright, sunny day out there. Um, one thing I've noticed is that we're hearing more and more of the trains going by. The, the testing's getting more frequent. And uh, we also have already had our first accident, apparently. Uh, the LRT smacked a pickup truck on the, just up by Bonnie Mall. And then someone said, yeah, the LRT, we're so, we're so behind schedule, we're having accidents even when people are not operating it. So I draw your attention to the various notices in the bulletin, and I think there's uh, at least one announcement to be made, so I'm just going to sit down. Well, more than one. Good morning. Uh, this message is from Christian Development um, for all of you and everyone in YouTube land. Um, one of the things that is very consistent about um, our discussions and in particular Sandy's lectures that he's been um, sharing with us recently, a consistency is the importance of context. And Sandy, with his incredible knowledge of biblical history, is able to provide that context. Context in terms of uh, the given scripture that we're looking at, who was the writer at the time? Um, what was the nature of their life? Who was their audience? And what was going on at the time that um, the writing was taking place? When we're discussing, when we're listening to Sandy's lecture about Paul, again, he talked about context. And one of the things that stood out for me is that Paul was not writing for us. He was not writing for, age, for the ages. He was writing with a sense of urgency and um, directing his letters, his teachings at very specific communities. And yet, through the ages, Paul has been recognized as the apostle of the Protestant church. So the question is why? And that's one of the things that we'll be discussing when we meet um, on Tuesday, as well as what is it about Paul's message that has spoken to us through the ages, even though it wasn't written for us. And then what about our context? Who are we now? What is the world that we're living in and how can Paul's message speak to us today? So those are some of the things that we'll discuss on Tuesday. And uh, once again, um, we'll all also have some laughs. That's guaranteed. And uh, all are welcome. Uh, whether you've had a chance to listen to the lecture or not, you're welcome to join us at 1 o'clock this coming Tuesday in the upper room. Thank you. Hello, it's Karen again, and I'm speaking to you on behalf of Mission Outreach. We are about to start our next campaign. For those in the church, we can read these, um, what's in the, the bulletin, but for those of you who might be listening at home, we are starting the 28 Days of Giving campaign, which supports the Edmonton Food Bank, and it will run during the month of February. We can't solve all of the world's problems, but we can certainly lend a hand at helping some of the ones here in our own city. So we, we've we done this for the last two years now. It's been very successful. We're suggesting for $1 a day collectively, we can help sustain the food bank, which continues to experience increasing demands and usage. You could donate $28, um, a check's made payable to Stradling United, or give whatever is you feel comfortable with. I. <coughs> Know that I know that the need is great, and I know that all of you do as well. We don't need a lot of incentives or challenges, but you know, economic times are making it tough for many. This has been going on for a long time, and I was thinking actually last week when I was sitting in the choir loft that when I was teaching school, which was for many years in several different elementary schools, we did food bank drives 
almost every year at some time, at some point. And it was a case of we oftentimes would maybe choose a food item, whether it was canned goods or mac and cheese or cereal boxes or whatever. Classrooms would have little competitions of who could collect the most. The whole idea was not, you know, what we were doing it for was important, but we wanted to put some incentives and challenges in and make it fun. So I thought to myself, why not try something a little different? So we're adding this challenge of maybe trying to fill a pew at the back with cereal boxes. We've all seen the promotions in the grocery store as you're going down the thing and it's buy, buy one, get the second one free, do whatever you can. Why not do that this month? Pick up one for yourself and bring it in. And let's see if we can't add a whole bunch of the cereal boxes. And then I think it's just something that gives us a little bit of extra incentive or make it a little bit more fun. And I think it's you that said about the, how about healthy cereal is a good idea too. <laughs> anyway, uh, who was it? Who well was also it? maybe some fun cereal as yeah, well. Yeah, but can be healthy and fun. Yes, yeah. that was the whole idea. I don't know if that's and, true. And you know, I chose cereal because in the end, it's probably a lot lighter than a whole bunch of cans. So <laughs> there we go. <clears throat> so anyway, let's share these those deals from the food and support the food bank. Together, we can help those in need. Thank you. I'll avoid telling my food bank story about cereal boxes. Uh, <laughs> before we start the, the service, I um, and I was appreciate both of the. Uh, it's an in, it's an interesting mixture of the announcements we had, the kind of the spiritual life and the the kind of the mission side. So it's kind of a nice balance. But you'll I'll just point out in your bulletin, you'll notice that we're having uh, two pieces, uh, one by uh, Pelagius and another one by Saint Augustine. Um, and I didn't know this until I actually did that they're actually both born in the same year. Uh, the reason that I find this kind of interesting is because um, we were talking about context and historical whatever. These two figures are very important figures in the history of the early church. And it is fair to say that if they were to see a church that 1600 years later would have their names in the same bulletin, they would be coming after me with rusty knives. They hated each other's guts. <laughs> In fact, uh, St. Augustine made his career out of attacking Pelagius' uh, heresy, as he called it. And uh, I think it's fair to say that Pelagius thought that St. Augustine was a little too tightly wound. Um, I'm actually more on Pelagius' side than that, <laughs> as far as I'm concerned. But the, 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 the reason I just want to take a few moments to talk about it, that these are very different strands of Christian belief. Uh, very different, you know, Pelagius is, and the, the kind of the interesting thing about Pelagius and Augustine for that matter, is that they represent the larger church. Uh, Pelagius was originally from the British Isles. Um, so he's probably like one of the first British heretics. Uh, Saint Augustine was from Libya. And so already we're having these m different voices within the history of the church, different theologies, different beliefs, and different ways of looking at faith. And so I think it's, I find value in both sets of beliefs, even though they probably wouldn't have so agreed with me, but this is just part of the, ch the church, you know, the different points of view we have. So let's just take a moment, and we will be lighting the Christ candle in memory of Milton Earl Sharman, who some may already have heard he passed away recently. Uh, Milton was a member of our congregation and was a member of long standing and so today we will hold Milton and his family in our and their loved ones in our thoughts and prayers. You will realize that the doctrines are inventions of the human mind as it tries to penetrate the mystery of God. You will realize that scripture itself is the work of human minds recording the example and teachings of Jesus. Thus, it is not what you believe that matters, 
It is how you respond with your heart and your actions. It is not believing in Christ that matters. It is becoming like him. Our opening hymn is Here, O God, Your Servants Gather, Voices United 362. That's 362. approach God in prayer. God of life, there are days when the burdens we carry are heavy on our shoulders and weigh us down. When the road seems dreary and endless, the sky is grey and threatening. When our lives have no music in them, our hearts lonely, our souls losing their courage. Flood the path with light. Turn our eyes to where the skies are full of promise. Tune our hearts to brave music. Give us a sense of comradeship with the heroes and saints of every age. So quicken our spirits that we may be able to encourage the souls of all who journey with us on the road to life, to your honor and glory. Let us share in the United Church Creed. We are not alone. We live in God's world. We believe in God who has created and is creating, who has come in Jesus, the Word made flesh, to reconcile and make new, who works in us and others by the Spirit. We trust in God. We are called to be the Church to celebrate God's presence, to live with respect in creation, to love and serve others.
to seek justice and resist evil, to proclaim Jesus crucified and risen, our judge and our hope, in life, in death, in life beyond death. God is with us. We are not alone. Thanks be to God. We shall sing Spirit of Life, Voices United 381, as we enter into our time of confession. And we will be following the the Lord's Prayer as printed in the bulletin, because it's the version from the Gospel of Matthew. From that time, Jesus began to proclaim, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. God, we gather before you. In the Beatitudes, you offer a path to your kingdom, yet we struggle to follow. We wonder, do we have the strength and compassion to take this path? It seems so different from the ways of the world around us. God, forgive our doubts in your faith in us. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Pray then in this way. Our Father in heaven, May your name be revered as holy. May your kingdom come. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we have also forgiven our debtors. And do not bring us to the time of trial, but rescue us from the evil one. For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Our next hymn is Though I May Speak, Voices United 372. That's 372. Seated. 
in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Our responsive reading is Matthew 5, 1 to 12, the Beatitudes. When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up to the mountain, and after he sat down, his disciples came to him. Then he began to speak and taught them, saying, Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people revile you and persecute you and are all kinds of evil against you falsely on my Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. A reading from Paul's first letter to the Corinthians. 
For the message about the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of the age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, God decided for the foolishness of our proclamation to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs and Greeks desire wisdom, but we proclaim Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and a foolishness to Gentiles. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. For God's foolishness is wiser than human wisdom, and God's weakness is stronger than human strength. Consider your own call, brothers and sisters. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, things that are not, to reduce to nothing things that are, so that no one might boast in the presence of God. He is the source of your life in the Christ Jesus who became for us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption in order as it is written that the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I was just, as I was reflecting on the reading from Paul, uh, relation to the Beatitudes and one of the points that I often make about Paul and uh, very well uh, articulated by, uh, by Ruth was the, the nature of what Paul writes and one of the things that is frustrating about Paul and there's a lot of frustrating stuff about Paul is he, is he doesn't mention much of what Jesus actually taught like for example there's no mention of the Beatitudes in Paul's letters and so sometimes there is a tendency to kind of dismiss Paul uh, as someone who doesn't really know what he's talking about, that with his fixation on the, on the cross and the resurrection, that he doesn't really have much to say about how we live our lives in faith. And this was in many circles, particularly in mainstream progressive churches, this was kind of almost like an ad for faith. And when I started off in the church, I was kind of of that same ilk myself. But the more I began to understand about Paul was Paul is a person who does not want to be slowed down by details. That sense of urgency. And what Paul operates is he, he assumes that the reader knows what he's talking about. You know, this is a problem. We don't. <laughs> and whereas Paul might not give us the details of of Jesus's ministry what we certainly hear and when we'll be hearing this particularly when we look at the Beatitudes is Paul very much gets the sense of the nature of what Jesus is preaching proclaiming the urgency the upset of what we think is normal the complete radical inversion of what we believe to be the way things to work Paul gets that about Jesus's ministry it's just that he doesn't want to spend much time rattling on about the specific details get the message so so when it comes to Christianity and when it comes to Christianity as an institution and its relationship with the Beatitudes what does that look like one of my favorite quotes involving the Beatitudes Kurt, uh, is from Kurt Vonnegut I can never pronounce the name Vonnegut for some reason, the most vocal Christians among us never mention the Beatitudes. But often with tears in their eyes, they demand that the Ten Commandments be posted in public buildings. And of course, that's Moses, not Jesus. I haven't heard one of them demand that the Sermon on the Mount, the Beatitudes, be posted anywhere. Blessed are the merciful in a courtroom. Blessed are the peacemakers in the Pentagon. 
give me a break. But why? You know, especially in those places that, you know, for example, the UK. The UK is an actual Christian nation, technically. You know, when uh, the UK is not a secular nation in the terms of law. But I never heard of the Beatitudes being put in any display anywhere. Now, I guess in some cases they use a, a horrible term, Judeo-Christian ethics. By the way, that's an awful term. I recommend you stop using it right now because there's no such thing as Judeo-Christian ethics. Just ask Jews what they think about Christians borrowing their points of view. You know, we have similar laws and whatever. But, yeah, the Christians seem to have this kind of ambiguity about the Beatitudes even though it is at the core of Jesus' teachings. Why? Why the ambiguity? Well, I think the reality is it's a wonderful idea, but it's never going to happen. What would happen if all Christian faiths, say, for example, 1914 is a good example. Uh, the First World War was initiated by Christian nations. So whenever you want to think about Islamic terrorism or whatever, you might want to start thinking about European history. Each nation involved in the beginning of the First World War were fairly upstanding Christian nations. There's bishops, archbishops, popes, ministers, the whole kit and caboodle. Some of the soldiers marched into battle with belt buckles saying, God is with us. What would have happened if all the leaders, the Archbishop of Canterbury, the Pope, the head of the church in Germany, the, the patriarch of the church in Rome and whatever, and, and sorry, Moscow and whatever, if all of them had stood up in one and said, do not fight as a Christian because blessed are the peacemakers. Would have been nice. Instead, they were blessing each other's, they were blessing their respective armies. They were all fighting the good cause. Or what would happen if all churches promoted agendas to ensure that the powerless of this world will inherit the earth? That all the churches decided to sell off their resources to create a fund for investment in public education, public health, all of it. You know, leave enough for rooms for people to be in, but you know, like get rid of all the old statues and whatever. There is a tension between the vision of the Beatitudes and the reality of the world and the reality of the church in the world that I think is very well illustrated by the quote a uh, quote from Archbishop Oscar Romero, which I just shared yesterday. This is how <laughs> this is how last minute my sermons can be sometimes. All the Beatitudes subvert what the world believes in. They sow the seed of a transformation that we will not see finished until the kingdom of heaven. The goal Christ points out to, out to us as the infinite horizon becomes reality. Because Jesus is clear. The Beatitudes are not meant to be some wistful thought about wouldn't it be nice if this is how the world could be. They're a challenge. They're a challenge for us to be part of how the kingdom of heaven will emerge among us. Look at the language. Jesus says, blessed are. He's talking to people, saying there are people amongst them in this midst, in his world at this moment, people living in the world, willing to do what they can to be part of this vision that there are people who, will, who are peacemakers, who are pure in heart, who are thirsting for righteousness. And just to get the point, just to kind of, you know, to kind of, as I say, the radical aspect, the first beatitude. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now, 
there'd be a fair number of people who listen to that then and I'm sure you right now listening to that will be asking themselves in the privacy of their own skull because they're not going to say it out loud why do the poor in spirit deserve such an honour? Why should be why should be poor in spirit be something? Should be poor in spirit be something that prevents you from entering the kingdom of heaven out of your perceived lack of faith? Surely the kingdom of heaven belongs to those who are righteous, especially those who have always been righteous. These arguments, these observations, ignore the point of what Jesus is saying about the nature of the kingdom. With his vision of the kingdom and who will enter it, Jesus invites us to reflect on the question, why are people poor in spirit? And why does God offer such an invitation to them? Because the reality is that people all too often become poor in spirit is a consequence of the world we have made. People struggle to understand what's expected of them by the powers of the world. And when it comes to religion, holy, mackerel, many people are trapped in that belief that they are poor in spirit. As they struggle to understand what is expected of them by those who declare that they are God's representatives in the world. Too many people have been told they are poor in spirit because they struggle to accept and embrace various doctrines, beliefs, and ways of life. What do you mean you don't accept the full presence of Christ in the Eucharist? How weak is your faith? What do you mean you don't understand the importance of making sure the pews are in the right place? Holy mackerel, you're one of those heretics, aren't you? People are told they're poor in spirit. And they're told that they're unworthy. That's what it means to be labeled as being poor in spirit, unworthy of God's love because you struggle, because you have doubts, because you have questions. But here Jesus is saying the poor in spirit are just the people God is looking for to be part of the way of the kingdom of heaven. That these are people who are aware of what it means to struggle with the question. Where is God in our lives? Does God even listen to us? And so when God reaches out to them to touch their lives in such a way that they know that they are worthy of God's love, Jesus has faith that such people will be willing to share this hope with others because they know what it means to be poor in spirit and they know what it means to be touched by God's grace. They know what it's like to be judged, to be stung by the feeling of someone declaring you to be unworthy because you don't meet other people's expectations. The kingdom of heaven emerges through people who understand pain and suffering and do what they can to heal the pain in others. It is a kingdom of wounded people who have decided that they will try and help others, serve others, to heal their wounds together. This is the common theme of the Beatitudes. We see it through like this wonderful ribbon of grace. Blessed are the peacemakers. These are people who understand the pain caused by division within the community and do what they can to heal such divisions. How will this be accomplished? It begins by asking questions, finding out the circumstances behind the divisions, who's in pain, and what can be done to heal this pain so the community may be reconciled with one another. Blessed are the merciful. The hope of forgiveness that those who endure suffering through the actions of others are able to forgive Forgi are able to offer forgiveness to those who have wounded them and doing so may break the cycle of violence as a reality of our world. To say in the midst of your pain probably in a hesitant voice 
I will do what is unexpected. I will forgive you. It's truly a glimpse of the mystery of grace, a glimpse of the kingdom amongst us. What I believe at the heart of the Beatitudes is an awareness of the importance of empathy, of understanding other people's feelings, being open to conversation, being open to willingness to share, to hear, to listen to someone, and maybe in doing so to begin the process of breaking down the barriers that separate us from one another. In other words, as too many people would disparagingly say, thinking they're being ever so clever, to be woke. To be woke to the pain endured by those who endure oppression. To be woke to be the pain endured by the victims of injustice. To be woke to the pain endured by the victims of war and conflict. To be woke to the pain endured by those ignored and cast off by our world because they're deemed to be poor in spirit. To be woke to the pain endured by those who struggle to make the world a better place but are considered a threat to the world's vested interests. I always take it as a compliment when someone calls me woke. It means, to me, it means I am paying attention to what's going on. I'm not willing to listen to the kind of the tired old lies that make our world work in the way that it does. To put it simply, in the Beatitudes, we are invited to be called to be woke to the pain of the world so we can do something about it. Because as Jesus reminds us, as we are loved by God, let us do what we can to love one another. And to love one another is to serve one another. Maybe we don't need to put the Beatitudes in public places. Again, you know, I remember last year this whole malarkey about knocking down statues. And I thought that was ridiculous, this idea that by knocking down a statue or replacing a statue, we were eroding history. History is found in books. You don't need a statue to tell you who a person was. You read the book. You avoid the history channel. You read the book. You read the story. Just like we don't need the Beatitudes in platforms or whatever. We read the Beatitudes. We live the Beatitudes. We become the Beatitudes. Amen. this time we take a moment and we offer our thanksgiving for all the work of the people of this church and the many ministries that this church continues to offer in these days and we give thanks for all those who serve the, the infrastructure of the church and the work that is done and a reminder that uh, there is always opportunity to share your gifts in any form and your gifts of um, ministry your gifts of wisdom, your gifts of time talent and treasure and so we give you thanks for all the opportunities that people share let us take a moment as we enter into our time of prayer. And I need to check my papers to see where I am. Ah, yep. Uh, we shall begin our prayers to the people with Lord, listen to your children praying. Voices United 400. <laughs> God, we give you thanks for the vision, the hope, 
the invitation and the struggle of the Beatitudes. A guide to your kingdom, a way to be in relationship with you and with one another. And we give you thanks for the people in our lives who strive to be the Beatitudes and how they touch our lives, how they bring healing, compassion, redemption. We give thanks for their faith that through their witness the world will be a better place. And so in silence, O oh God, we bring these names to you in thanksgiving. God, we pray for our broken world, a world mired in conflict and war, civil unrest, political instability, economic instability. We pray for all victims of violence, for the loved ones that are left behind, wondering why. We pray for all victims of injustice. We pray for our broken world. We pray, O oh God, for your strength and compassion that we may live the hope of the Beatitudes in a world that needs to hear an alternative. An alternative to pain, injustice, violence, that we can be your presence, your body, that will offer a hand of care, a hand of healing. And let it begin with our prayers, O oh God. We bring to you our prayers for all who mourn. Especially we pray for the Sharman family as they mourn the loss of Milton. We bring our prayers for all who struggle with illness of mind, body, and spirit. For those who are alone. For those who yearn for connection. In silence we bring these names to you. Our closing hymn is Be Thou My Vision, Voices United 642. That's 642. <laughs>
from the book of Micah. He has told you, O mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? But to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God. Oh, okay. By the way, it should be Capilano. I yeah, it should be Capilano, okay. So everyone who knows men's breakfast is Capilano. <laughs> Thanks.